Congressman, good morning to you. Good morning. I'm here in mid forties. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Now what, summer's now, over, man. Summer is over. What's the uh, what's the nation's capitals uh, weather like? I think it's going to be today probably eighties, eighties and sunny. But uh, you know, it's a little chilly for the nation's capital, but that makes it actually comfortable. But I think this can be a pretty rough winter, man. I uh, it's been it's been cold and <laughs> cold and hurricaney. Yeah, boy, it really has. You know, we're we're looking at the devastation that's down in Houston and the uh, and the hazards of that cleanup that are going to go on for months and or years, depending on on where you're looking. Now we've got Hurricane Irma making contact in the Caribbean. I saw some video. I'm sure you probably looked at it as well from St. Martin's this morning that just looks horrific. Yeah. And Florida appears to be squarely in the path of what's what's coming our way. What are your thoughts on all of this? Well, it's, it looks like it's like a category, you know, higher than one that's ever existed. So um, at this point, uh, it is. Saying, it's the most powerful one that they've ever, uh, ever tracked. Yeah. Yeah. Like category 30 or something. Yeah. But, I, you know, look, it's yeah, this is the role of the federal government. We're gonna we're gonna deal with uh, with the Houston situation. I actually uh, flew a plane down there for the guard uh, over the break here. I didn't go do a lot, but took the plane down to get some to get some uh, do some oversight of what's going on. And you know, the, so Houston's gonna get taken care of. This has the potential of doing some pretty massive damage, although it doesn't sound like it's gonna sit there and create the flooding like it did for Houston. But um, you know, we've been lucky from a hurricane perspective. I, I think the last decade we've been pretty much spared. You know, it used to be we'd get them once or twice every year, and looks like we're just back to kind of a normal year here. But we're we're paying a little bit for our good luck in the past. Yeah, and you you make an excellent point. Over the last decade or so, I think there's been what scant landfall, maybe once or so. Uh, yeah. In spite of the predictions of an inconvenient truth, uh, none of those yeah. things came <laughs> into fruition, which was why Al Gore and others are trying to make as much hay as they can out of what's happening right now. Yeah, they they take advantage of people's uh, failure to remember. Uh, long-term history and only, you know, bank on their near-term history. So they look at it and say, look, two really terrible, devastating hurricanes, therefore X. They don't look at the fact that, like we said, for the last 10 years, there really hasn't been any hurricanes. In fact, they probably last year were saying there haven't been any hurricanes because of this. And now it's, <laughs> there's hurricanes because of this. So everything, it's confirmation bias, right? Everything can confirm uh, what your preconceived conclusion already is. Yeah, that and the, uh, of course, let's run to make something that's devastating and horrible and may kill a bunch of people. Let's try to make it political if we can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, sometimes, that, look, sometimes ne weather just happens, right? Sometimes <laughs> God uh, may, you know, allows a hurricane to spin up or whatever. It's just how, it's just how weather works on this grief. <laughs> and things are ever changing as they as they always have been. Speaking of things that are changing, uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on. Uh, boy, there's a lot of weeping, gnashing of teeth, cheering, stomping, uh, a lot being made of the phase out of DACA. Yeah, what's your take? Well, my thought on it is, I actually think the president's doing the right thing and uh, and saying, look, this is in the purview of Congress to deal with. Now, I actually support the DACA program. I think you know, eight hundred thousand people that know no other country. Um, you know, that uh, pass background checks, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America should be put in a place to get legal status, not citizenship, legal status. And then they can get in the back of the line, you know, in front behind those that are actually been doing the process legally. Uh, but that said, the president, the way he President Obama went about it was illegal through an executive order. We executive orders have a role. Uh, president Trump has done some great executive orders in terms of rolling back regulations. But executive orders are not meant to do what Congress should do, which is to set the laws of this nation, the immigration laws. So I think the president did the right thing by saying, you know, look, we're going to phase this out and give Congress six months to come up with a solution. And he said yesterday, and this is where I, I said I think it became a good thing, he said yesterday he hopes Congress does this. And, uh, and I actually am optimistic that we can and we will. And uh, but this is absolutely not the role of the president to unilaterally make a decision. And so I think it's right to roll it back. Well, and then, you know, I guess that's the thing that, that, that caused me some concern, because I can remember when at the time that it happened when the executive order went through 2012, um, implemented under the president in 2012. And uh, there was some uh, anger about it and some uh, some second guessing. And he basically said, well, if you don't like it, win some elections. All right. Yeah, exactly. Well, then some we elections have been won in that interim. <laughs> so yesterday I expected when the former president made his statement, it would be, well, you know, you control things now. You got to do what you see fit. No, that still wasn't quite good enough. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, you know, I knew that wasn't going to be a statement. No. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and uh, look, it's, it's, 
there, it, it, if I was registered under the DACA program, if I was a young person that had registered, I'd be nervous, right? I mean, obviously you're looking at the fact that, that this, you know, potentially could end. But I think in talking to my Republican colleagues and seeing Republican leaders, not, not in Congress, but, you know, whether it's on television, radio, or whatever, I think people understand that this is a really easy fix for us to do. And, and I think there's not many people that really out there that would call themselves Christ followers would say that, you know, we need to deport 800,000 people that know no other country but their own. So the question is how we fix this, get them to where they can, uh, you know, get into the back of the line behind anybody else, uh, but also they can become productive citizens or productive members of society, not necessarily citizens. And it'll be interesting to see how, how it all shakes out. And it would be nice to see that actual news coverage of it, look at it from that angle rather than right. a, a unilateral move that is just a, a terrible thing, forgetting that it all got started by a unilateral move. That's right. And I think, by the way, it, that's a great point. I also think, you know, look, once the kind of emotion shakes out, I actually was watching CNN the other night had this great, it was called The Reagan Show, if anybody saw that. Um, and it was just a documentary on Ronald Reagan. As president, I thought it was actually pretty fair to him. But you realize the same debates we're having today, the same thing some people are calling President Trump, is the same thing that Ronald Reagan dealt with. And, and what I came to realize, it opened my eyes, was it's going to take, during these moments, um, we're going to have our battles, people are going to say all their terrible things, but it's going to take getting results for people to look back and say, that was a successful presidency or time, and so that's where it's incumbent on us to, to get some results out here. Hey, before I let you you get out of here, I gotta I gotta ask you the big question there. And this, you know, <laughs> this it's been on a lot of people's minds over the last well, well gee, almost uh, three four months at this particular point. My daughter said to me last night, "Hey, this Korea thing, how worried do yeah. I need to be?" Now, when your twenty year old daughter uh, looks at you and asks that question, uh, I said, "Well, I, I have an expert joining me on the show tomorrow. He might give a better perspective." Well, that's nice of you to say. Um, I'll give you 20 bucks later. Okay, um, perfect. My thing on it is this. I say don't be hysteric about it. As an example, I was talking to a couple that said they canceled their vacation to Hawaii because they were worried about North Korea. That's hysteria, right? The United States is safe. I think, though, we are at a point where military action has been as close as it's ever been since the actual Korean War. And, uh, and that's because it's not President Trump's rhetoric. Let's be very clear about that. He's lefties that claim somehow rhetoric has led to the nuclearization of Korea. Uh, it's, it's typical blame America first. It is because Kim Jong-un has decided he wants to have a nuclear country. Now, if we give him the ability to have nuclear weapons, we'll never be able to stop Iran or any other country from acquiring nuclear weapons morally. And so I think we're as close as we've ever been to military action. I think people need to pay attention. Uh, I think that is the last case scenario, or last case resort, but I think it is a resort. We have the military in North Korea or in Korea for a reason, a doomsday scenario. And this is a doomsday scenario. That said, don't lose sleep at night because you live in the best country in the world. We are safe here. And it would appear that, you know, that those who would normally get in our way over everything are kind of standing with us on this one. China's looking at this going, man, you are really causing a problem here on my flank. Yeah, I think so. And that's where... I think, you look, to use the diplomatic instrument of power, this is something President Obama forgot or didn't know, you have to back it with the military instrument of power. You know, the talk softly and carry a big stick is not saying you don't say anything. It's saying use military to back diplomatic talk. And that's what President Trump is doing. And all these talking heads that go on TV and say there's no military option, it's unthinkable, it'll never happen, are not helping the cause. Well, no, because we, we've seen what happens when, uh, when uh, despots hear that about other things. That's oh, right. military That's action's right. off the table. Oh, okay. You know, it's like your parents saying, well, I won't punish you if you do something wrong. I just don't want you to do it. Yeah, it's like, why would I, why would I get rid of my nukes if I know there is no military option? Let me be clear, in case Kim Jong-un is listening to you this morning, <laughs> let yes. me be clear. <laughs> there is a military option. The military option results in his death, the end of his regime, and an American victory. Now, it's messy. But every war has been messy. It's just, you know, they've gotten used to more wars being a little less messy than they have in the past. Yeah, so think very carefully. You really don't want any of this. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's probably the way to, to look at it best. Congressman, as always, I appreciate the generosity of your time. Uh, you, you, fight no the, you fight the good fight. I look forward to the next time we can get together and talk. Anytime. Take care.